Welcome to Walnut United Methodist Church. Uh, I am the pastor, Krista Givens, and I am here to guide you through this wonderful opportunity for us to worship together today. So uh, I will begin by saying that we are glad you're here. Uh, no matter who you are or where you are worshiping, you're always welcome in our community. A little bit of an intro. Uh, this week we have a little bit uh, different situation in that we are incorporating um, our community into this worship experience. We have wonderful music by uh, Grace Amador, who is our wonderful pianist. And uh, we have a special anthem by Mark Durrell, uh, who's a member of our choir and has a beautiful voice. So please enjoy that. If you would like to uh, join our worship experience, then um, please let me know and we'll find a way to work you in. Uh, it will be a, a unique experience because we are having you record yourself, send me the files, and then I incorporate them into our video experience. So if you are interested in that, please let me know. Uh, tomorrow night on uh, Monday, uh, March 30th, we have a Zoom church council meeting. So that's at 7 p.m. Um, and we will be gathering in our own homes, but uh, over Zoom, to um, deal with some of the, the uh, particular details about this time in the life of our church. We've also had an offer to help if you have uh, needs, errands to run or uh, grocery needs. Uh, we have a few individuals in our church who are willing to do those for you. So if you um, have a need, please give me a call or uh, email me and I will send you their information. With all that being said, uh, let us join together in the call to worship. All who are suffering under the weight of this world come forth to new life. All who are living in darkness and despair come out into the light. All who feel separated and alone Come to the presence of God, whose spirit finds us here. Join me now in our opening prayer. Come Holy Spirit, breathe new life into our lives and our worship. Create new possibilities in our imaginations and in our dreams. Send the promise of your hope into our depression and our despair. Expand our hearts and our minds as we enter your presence this day. Amen.
us join together in prayer. Lord, we come to you with joys and concerns in our hearts. And today we lift these, your children, into your care. Lord, we pray for those who have been affected by the coronavirus, especially those who are sick, battling for their lives. We pray for them and their families. We pray for all of those in the medical field. Give them strength and courage and perseverance to continue. We are so grateful each day for their sacrifice of time and energy. Hold them in your arms, Lord, and lift them up. We pray for all of those who have lost jobs in this crisis, those who are experiencing fear, not only of the virus, but fear of the unknown. Lord, we pray for those in our community who are in need of your help and healing. Today, Lord, we lift up Telma in her recurrence of cancer. We also lift up Joelle and all of those who are giving care to others. We give you thanks that uh, Justin has tested negative for the virus, had a good surgery, and is healing well. We give you thanks for all of the personnel in the hospital, for Stacy and Joe and all of the caregivers. We give you thanks that uh, Linda and Carol have returned from their vacation. We give you thanks for our lives. We give you thanks for our friends. And we give you thanks for this experience and all of the lessons that we have learned. Lord, help us to let go of our fear because life is God's promise. Help us to come out of the darkness to risk believing in the words and the lessons of Jesus. God, be with us on our journey to the cross. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Our scripture lesson is from the book of John, chapter 11. The whole story is found in verses 1 through 45, but I will be reading verses 1 through 6, verse 17, and then verses 32 through 45. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead for four days. And Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and seen what Jesus did, believed in him. May God add a blessing to the reading of this scripture. What does it mean to be alive? On Ash Wednesday this year, uh, February 26th, I decided to adopt a spiritual practice for Lent. I would post one good news story each day on my Facebook page. I would look through the news, uh, all of the different news sites, and find one story that illuminated the hope, the joy, the kindness that we need during this time. 40 days of good news. For the first week, it seemed like a good practice. As I posted stories about cute animals and stories about helpful neighbors and tips for living your best life, and then it became more difficult to find good news stories as cases of the virus increased and the number of deaths by the virus grew and grew and grew. So this week, I changed my Lenten practice. It was no longer the same world. We were no longer the same people. Our experience with this time of isolation and social distancing and fear was changing us. So I began to ask questions to my Facebook friends. What are you grateful for? How are you staying connected with your people? What habits have you adopted that you would like to keep after all of this is over? So I wanted to share some of the answers I received when I asked my Facebook friends, 
What have you learned from this experience? These are some of their responses. I learned that going with love is always right. I've learned that I can't control much in life. I've learned that things which seem impossible a week or two ago suddenly become possible, good and bad. I have learned that I do not have enough food in the house to sustain two teenagers who are completely bored. I have learned that even when I have more time, my house is not clean. I have learned that in spite of what's going on, we still have a lot to be thankful for. Our love for family and friends goes deeper. I've learned to let it all go and live for today. I'm not worried about having enough of whatever. So what does it mean to be alive? This is the question that our scripture asks today. So we'll take a look at our scripture from John chapter 11. As I said, um, the whole story is from chapter uh, 11 verses 1 through 45. And I just chose out the, the prime text. So 1 through 6, 17, and 42 through 45. 32 through 45. Okay. So to set the stage now, Jesus and his disciples have been traveling through Judea, performing what John uh, calls them signs. Healing the blind and curing the sick, all to the chagrin of the Pharisees, who challenge him as to his authority, his defiance of the Torah law, especially regarding healing on the Sabbath. And also, by what power he is doing these signs. So John begins uh, in chapter 11 this. Now, a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Now Mary, John is telling us, reminding us, was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. But her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory so that the son of God may be glorified through it. Now, if you watched the video from last week, uh, one of the good things about this situation that if you haven't watched the video from last week, you can always go back and watch the video from last week. Our story from last week um, recognizes that Jesus uses almost the identical phrasing as he did when he was confronted with the man who's born blind. Our lesson last, last week described the healing of the blind man and uh, Jesus explained to his disciples that his blindness was not a circumstance of sin. Remember, they asked him, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? But he said, no, no, that's not the, the point. He was not born blind as a circumstance of sin, but his blindness will be used for the glory of God. And so now here we have the same reason utilized. He says, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. So he says, this illness does not lead to death. But is this true? This event, the healing and resurrection of Lazarus, actually will lead to death. Not the death of Lazarus, but the death of Jesus. Author Brian Stoffringen explains this, it is a resurrection that leads to death. Jesus, by returning to Judea to give life to another, will give up his own life as the chief priests and the Pharisees decide to put him to death. Jesus' great power of giving life only raises the anger and the power of those who want to take his life. 
So after hearing about Lazarus, we would expect after hearing that this is one of his good friends, that this is the person who Jesus loved or a person who Jesus loved, that we would expect that he would rush to his side in order to help his friend. But John explains in verse five, accordingly, John says, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after hurting, hearing that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. And when Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. So Jesus stalled and Mary and Martha were mad. I mean, why wouldn't they be? How could you stay away? They said, you were our only hope. And you, the one who saves strangers, could not be bothered to come in time to save your friend, our brother? Now, Jesus spent four days away from Bethany. One day for the messenger to travel and tell Jesus about the illness, and two days of waiting there and then one day for Jesus and the disciples to travel to Lazarus. There was a Jewish tradition at the time that one's soul hovered over the deceased body for three days. And after that time, there was no hope of resurrection. So by staying away for four days, Jesus not only ensured the death of his friend, but extinguished all hope for resurrection. He was really, really dead by four days. In verse 33, it says, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her were also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. Now the Greek word here uh, translated that is greatly disturbed. It's also used again in verse 38, is the word, and my Greek is terrible, I'm sorry, embrima omai, embrima omai, which means anger. But not just mild anger. This was the word that was used to describe the sound of a horse when a horse is angry. So when Jesus saw Mary weeping and the Jews weeping, he was filled with horse snorting anger. So why was Jesus so angry? Was it the people's inadequate faith demonstrated by Martha and Mary? Was it his face-to-face -face confrontation with the finality of death that he was really angry that death was so permanent? Was it the large crowd who would witness and then misinterpret the miracle that he is about to do? We don't really know why he was so angry, but he was horse snorting angry. It says in verse 38, then Jesus again, greatly disturbed, horse snorting angry, he came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Now, what does this story sound like? A stone was lying against it and they roll away the stone. This is all a foreshadow of what's gonna happen in a couple of weeks. So. It was a, a cave and the stone was lying against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of the dead man said to him, um, Lord, already there is a stench because he's been dead for four days. Just in case you forgot Jesus, it's been four days. He's really, really dead. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed that you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. 
And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. And then he does this whole bit about um, reassuring people. He says, I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. When he said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews therefore who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. And so Lazarus returns to life. But it doesn't mean what we think it means. It doesn't mean that Lazarus will never die. Lazarus returns to life to live out his earthly time in this world and to die later. So Jesus gives him the gift of more time, a greater quantity of life. But he also offers Lazarus and Martha and Mary, the disciples and the witnesses in the crowds, a greater quality of life, faith in God and a relationship with our creator. That makes life worth living. So in response to this story of Lazarus, and in response to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we ask ourselves, what do we make of the time that we have been given? We have been given all of this time, maybe a little bit extra. How do we offer life to others around us? What sacrifices do we make so that others may live. It's important to think about during this time where we are staying at home. And although we may feel fine, although we may feel like we are invincible, we are taking some time, we're sacrificing the lives that we had so that perhaps our most vulnerable in our community can live longer. So we are offering them a gift of time in this world. How do we remind others that the power of life is just as great, if not greater, than the power of death? First, we can appreciate each day, each moment, each hour that we have been giving, each experience of living, even through the difficult times. Pope Paul VI suggested this. Somebody should tell us right at the start of our lives that we are dying. Then we might live life to the limit, every minute of every day. Do it, I say. Whatever you want to do, do it now. There are only so many tomorrows. Secondly, we can encourage others to live life to its fullest, to put more life in our lives, to enjoy life more, to laugh and love and appreciate the beauty around us. In fact, Saint Irenus of Lyons, he lived in the second century and was a disciple of Polycarp who was a disciple of the gospel writer, John. And Saint Irenaeus became the Bishop of Gaul, which is now modern day France. And he wrote this, the glory of God is the human person fully alive. The glory of God is the human person fully alive. The raising of Lazarus and the resurrection of Jesus himself reminds us that neither death 
nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus said in John 10, verse 10, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. What does abundant life mean to us at this point, in this time? May we live our lives fully, giving glory to God who created us and sustains us and gives us the resources to persevere now and always. Amen. to be the people of God. And may God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and go with you always. Amen.